Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game Podcast, and we have a very special repeat guest with us today, Dustin Stats, who's been with us several times. So, Dustin, once again, are you prepared to engage? I am ready. <laughs> Let's do this, and I'm actually going to read your intro again, because your bio, because it, it has changed a bit. You know, it's been quite a few years since the first podcast, so I'm going to go very quickly through it. And that is to say that he has experience working in the field of education in various capacities, including consulting, research, and running and hosting tutoring programs. And he is now the owner of Board Gaming with Education's brick and mortar store, BGE's Tabletop. And when he was in the classroom, he was always looking for ways to create more engaging classroom to develop a strong classroom culture and strengthen learning. And he's thrilled to be able to provide similar positive tabletop gaming experience to the community at BGE. And he couldn't do it without the support of his amazing wife, Grace. You can find him playing board games with friends, running the store, running around LA, training for races, or at any of the BGE's tabletop events. So Dustin, is there anything we haven't mentioned that you want to make sure that we have before we get into it? No, oh, no, I think that's that's a mouthful. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you so much, Rob, for having me on. I'm excited to be here. I'm trying to remember if, if I've came on three or four times if this is my fourth or third i remember <laughs> yeah you mentioned the first time was several years ago that was like seven maybe seven no six i don't know a long time ago <laughs> pretty, pretty long time ago probably not six we're about to get into the fifth anniversary which is pretty exciting but still not six. Oh, cool. <laughs> but a, a while ago that's for sure yeah that's for sure so Dustin, many things have been happening in your life since we last spoke. I'm actually going to get into Professor Game and check out when that was. But what are you doing these days? I, I always make this question and, and for you it's been a change. So what does it look like to be Dustin Stats these days? What are you doing? What what keeps your attention and your in, in this attention economy kind of space? Right. So you mentioned we opened our brick and mortar store. So we've been doing online sales for about two years and when we were doing that, we started off very small. We had carried two publishers and we were still, our website was boardgamewitheducation.com at the time. And we were really focused on games for learning, like only taking on games and selling games on our e-commerce website that would be available to use in the classroom or for at home learning, or we would create supplemental materials for those. Now we are a full on like hobby game store called BG's Tabletop. And we have that component, but we also do a lot of the other quote unquote traditional hobby store things like Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that. Interesting. Interesting. And and, and what's your sort of your involvement in, in all of this? You're, you, are you just organizing? Are you sort of game hosting? How, how are you doing these things? All of the above. <laughs> as a small store and as a store that my wife and I kind of bootstrapped and are starting on our own, we kind of, I kind of do everything. I am trying to pull back on some stuff. Well, I guess not pull back. We've hired on two staff that work four to six hours a week, so not a lot. Hmm. But they're essentially here so I can go host other programming in the store. For example, <laughs> I run a beginner's Pokemon class. I run a class Pokemon Collecting 101. I do some Dungeon Master, so DMing if you're not familiar with Dungeons and Dragons. That's the person that hosts the sessions. So doing a lot of stuff like that. I think the main thing for me is figuring out how to leverage those events to serve our community and then kind of running a store as a retail store. Cool. <laughs> so actually, I, I was checking back on, on the previous episodes, and I can say here that the first episode was in 2019, in June. Mm. So a little bit above three years ago, it seems like an okay. eternity because of the pandemic. <laughs> That's for sure. It does seem like a while ago. <laughs> it's got to be the longer last... than that, but... Oh, that was the yeah. most recent. Most recent. That, okay. No, no, that's the oldest one, actually. Oh, really? That's the first one. Well, that, that I could find anyways. <laughs> Maybe there's another one. Maybe you were on my show in mm, early be. on. Maybe that's what I'm mixing up. That could be. Then, And if we count my show and your show, there's probably like six or seven episodes between, <laughs> between us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be. And the latest one, however, was 
during the pandemic, we were talking mm. precisely about that. It was in 2020, April 16th, when we did the, um, this was an episode where we went live. It was my first sort of live episode. And it was the first time that oh, we were yeah. doing this kind of things. So yeah, that was two years ago, but still running strong here. Oh, yeah, <laughs> still, that, still going on. Wow. Yeah, that's a long time. <laughs> And precisely from that time, as you can tell, engagers, like if you if you check out that episode, you can go onto professorgame.com, you ch- check out stats with two A's, and you'll definitely find all the episodes from Dustin. But the point here is that many things have changed. Like we were talking about, you know, how COVID hit people and how online education was being affected and what mm. that meant as well for board gaming with education, for gamification and all these things. So the obvious question becomes, Dustin, what what has happened in in these years? Like, what's all this shift that you've been making? Perhaps, you know, sort of what was the route that took you there? Because you gave us sort of an intro into that. And of course, the the main thing, which is why why we went down that route. Right. I mean, all your listeners are very much, I assume, games for learning in in that sort of context. And that's definitely a big component of what we do in our game store, too. However, one thing I noticed as opening a retail store, doing games for learning is a little too niche. So we are more of an open hobby game store. And how Hmm. we kind of got there is just where the market took me a bit more than anything else. Where the market took me and what I was passionate about. I think those two things. Because obviously, if you're passionate about something and you're starting a business, if the market's not there (laughs) for it, the business isn't going to work. So yeah, I mean... When we talked, maybe the first time we were still, in, I was still in Taiwan, I can't remember. I know we, we've we discussed yeah, and for had sure. some conversations sure. when I was in Taiwan. And we, we were like an events-based business. And we were, quote unquote, profitable. But the level of profit was very little because we were running events maybe <laughs> once or twice a month. And then I did a lot of tutoring and stuff in Taiwan. So that was a kind of on the side of what I was also doing with the games for learning there. Um, Moving back, we knew that we couldn't just do learning English through tabletop games. So before we moved back to Taiwan, we kind of shifted our focus to board game with education instead of board game with English. And we wanted to do the same thing here, but we were going to do like maybe content based learning. So we would have a STEM board game camp. We would do things like that. And of course, the pandemic hit and we shifted to an e-commerce model. And from there, Over the pandemic, Mm. what was really cool, and I don't know if this happened in other parts of the world, but it definitely was something that really blew up here in Los Angeles were like, quote unquote, farmers markets or uh, night markets or exhibits, like a lot of like temporary setups, like they had one huge one outside of the mall here. And this is the mall that like the Kardashian shop at, like it's a in a pretty, (laughs) pretty uh, affluent area in Los Angeles. And they had this huge like night for vendors to come and sell their products. We had like a lot of great food vendors too. And so we started doing a lot of that stuff starting in March of last year. Oh my gosh, my timeline's all mixed up. I don't know the exact time, but it was it was about two years ago, maybe a little bit. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, it would be in March last year. Yeah. So then we did that. And then eventually it was like, okay, this is kind of working. We're selling some products. We're paying for these vendor space fees and still kind of making a profit. And so then we rented a kiosk inside of a mall here, not the same mall, a different one, because that same mall kiosk is crazy outrageously priced. <laughs> I'm not, I, I think maybe it could be profitable. I don't know. We did well at the other one. It was about two thirds of the price. So um, we did that over the holidays and that kind of helped us get some more funding to open our brick and mortar store. And we opened in April of this year. So 2022. Long ride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Dustin, it's it's been a wild ride in that sense, it seems. And you were saying, and I, I used to listen a lot to this entrepreneurship show. I, I, I We were talking about this in the pre-interview chat that I'm listening a lot less to podcasts than I usually, mm-hmm. you know, I usually did. But I used to listen to this guy and he was always saying like, you know, build an audience and, you know, sort of ask people what are they looking for or somehow sort of inform yourself of what they are actually needing. And that is where you find your market opportunity because this audience is obviously passionate somehow for what you do and and you're passionate about what what you're putting putting there. So it's kind of a good mix in a good place. And it seems it took you, as you were saying, like to something that you're still passionate about as well. But it's where, you know, the market, as you were saying, was actually guiding you towards. Right. And I guess one thing kind of I can share that I learned from the last few years and getting to this point, and I believe we talked about this on our podcast, the gamification toolkit is 
like don't be scared to hmm. try some things and don't be scared to kill things off essentially so i mean i don't know and there's probably a handful of things that we've tried more than a handful if we count some little trials but like the gamification toolkit it's still there we can go back to it if we want but it wasn't something that <laughs> that like because the pandemic hit for one but also we weren't really capturing a market for it. And then also we did something where we created uh, supplemental lesson plans for some of our games. And we have about 15 lesson plans that include uh, like how they align to standards, handouts and worksheets and stuff like that. But people weren't taking advantage of them. So what we did in our newsletters, we sent out a survey to see if anyone is really interested in these things. And no one filled out the survey. So we're like, okay, huh. we're creating these things. We're taking time to do it. We're spending resources to do it. Maybe we just pull back and stop doing this. And if someone really like reaches out to us about it or it's there's a need for it down the road, then it's something we can do in the future. Interesting. And it's a, it's a good way to gather feedback. And this is... You know, this applies very well to entrepreneurship in general, but definitely to the way things are done in games. You know, you, you, you're you constantly trying to gather feedback and see how it's going. Tabletops is a little bit harder because you, you send it to printing and it's in the hands of people and sort of calling <laughs> yeah. it back is almost impossible. Not to, not to put it entirely impossible, but with video games and digital solutions as well, you see your phone, and this is something that actually annoys me a little bit, is to see that it's constantly updating the apps, right? Mm. But it's for a good reason, right? They're, they're, in theory, at least, they're improving the product. They're seeing what's what's working, what's not. They're finding security issues and so on. And mm. they're constantly updating these things. And that is the way that many of the things need to be happening. Maybe the tabletop game you launched and it works or didn't work. But maybe the next edition or maybe the next game that you create, you're going to gather all of those feedbacks and all of those lessons that you got from, from, from that. I mean, hopefully you did gather <laughs> plenty of those during the design process as well. But it is always another opportunity. Yet there, there's yet another opportunity for you to gather feedback and to get better at your craft, at whatever it is that you're doing. Right. And um, before we kind of carry on the conversation, I want to share a gripe I have with updating things because I hate... <laughs> I always have to call my wife, say, hey, turn on my PlayStation, make sure my game's updated so I can play tonight. Because <laughs> otherwise you have to wait like a couple hours. And it's like, oh, man, we had an appointment. I had a date set with my cousin to play. And then now I can't play. Yeah. I, I, I literally, I, I, I remember with a lot of spite as well. <laughs> In yeah. particular, I, I, and don't get me wrong, I love the game. I love Fortnite and I play it, you know, more than I should probably. Every time I, I turn it on and it's like, I'm going to play and going to win a few crowns today. And <laughs> every time that happens, it says updating. Oh, and yeah. it never takes under, you know, 45 minutes. By the time that happens, you know, you already had dinner. You're probably, you know, ready to go to sleep or whatever <laughs> time you had for that is, is down to oh, 15 yeah. minutes, 20 minutes. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very annoying. Yeah. I, I always have an exit strategy and I have other games that don't <laughs> other stuff. Updating. Yeah. But... It is. It is super annoying. I I, I have to say that with 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 games and, and how it's been like. I, I do miss the the good old days. <laughs> That's it. Right. You would say right. you know you plug in your 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 cassette into the Nintendo or the Super Nintendo and that's it, right? Yeah. It, it pops up right and that and you play it there, uh, <laughs> with all the disadvantages it had. Right. 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 <laughs> And now I'm saying this, and I'm winding myself up. Right, I, I don't know if you saw that there's <laughs> yeah, a, a, a new, a, a new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. You know, mm. that is, is inspired on the '80s game that I played. You know, so much. All these things are happening. I, I think nostalgia in general is the, the 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 marketeers and the business people have realized how how strong nostalgia can be as oh, a geez, as yeah. a driver for purchase, and, and they're using it to big success. I have to say. Right. Right. Yeah. It's. I mean. Just like streaming culture too is one thing I noticed as a retail store owner. Like I have to carry stuff that is popular in streaming culture. And like, I don't know, this is not super game related, but those uh, plushies that are super popular, everybody has those because those <laughs> blew up through streaming culture. People would watch it on a stream and be like, oh, I got to get that. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and sort of bringing it back because you, you, you were mentioning this and, and, and it, it's, it is interesting to always like have some more insights into what you guys are doing at, at, at these stores is, so you usually, I'm guessing you mostly have board games and you have your events. Do you have other sort of, let's call them geeky materials around besides from the, the, the plushes and, and, and these, these things? How, how do you manage that? 
Yeah, we definitely do. And I think that's one thing that we kind of do in a way to set ourselves apart. I mean, the way we really establish ourselves from other game stores in the area is through like the games for learning, positive impacts of tabletop games. We have like camps and other stuff like that. But also, yeah, we carry like more more so during the holidays, I think we'll bring in more, but like anime figures. We have a few <laughs> puzzles, uh, plushies, like our our squishables. It's we carry squishables, which are there's squish mallows and squishables, and people sometimes confuse those. But I like squishables more. Maybe I'm biased. <laughs> um, squish mallows are like huge, round, chubby. I mean, they're kind of cute too. But yeah, so we do that. I mean, and then we do like tabletop games, and we do a lot of indie RPGs, which is another thing that kind of sets us apart from other game stores in the area. A lot of game stores are like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Dungeons and Dragons, like the staples, which are definitely something we carry. But we try to do some stuff that like, oh, you can't get anywhere unless you drive like downtown LA to get this stuff. Hmm, That's cool. And, and that's something that sets apart your store and, and as well. Like one of the things that I that I that I enjoy in general when I when I go to a store and of course I'm not in LA I'm in Madrid it's probably very different in many ways but one of the things that, because I mean if you if you're just looking if you already know what game you're going to purchase right you you can either go to the store and have a nice experience with the with the store owner or or the person who's there and giving you a great sort of a great service etc or you can buy it online right right but for me one of the big things that that I really enjoy and and, and that is especially valuable to me and that's something you'll you you can't get no at least not with the current technology is the experience of being there but also going there and saying oh i was thinking maybe of buying this game but you know what else do you got like these are the kinds of things that i want to do this is sort of the setting where i want to play and these are the kinds of games i like what do you recommend right Right, right. I mean, yeah, that's definitely like we are an expert in helping you find the correct tabletop gaming experience you're looking for. You can't do that at Target. You can do it online. It'll take you a bit of research and like digging Mm -hmm. around and reading comments and stuff. So, of course, watching videos. But yeah, we're here to help (laughs) you find like what you're looking for, what will be fun for your game group and your friends or whoever, whatever kind of experience you're looking for. And also the, the other thing that from what you were saying, and of course, given your background is if you're looking for a board game that goes, you know, beyond just being an entertainment game, it's something that you can still help people with, especially with the store and all the games you have there. Right, right. And again, that's something that we definitely do different from other game stores in the area. We, we, I mean, we carry games from two all the way up to adults. If you go to some other game stores in the area, you'll be lucky to find something for ages like two to eight. They might have like one or two <laughs> games sitting around or like something something that's like really popular. They have a few copies of that. But yeah, we, we have a wide range of games from like that age range two to eight that is kind of hard to find in game stores. Of course, like big box stores will have that stuff. Cool. That's very interesting stuff. Like, again, because as, as you were saying, like what differentiates you from other, you know, stores in the area, right? Because in the end, it's a very local business and it, like a board game store is, is something that you you drive up to or you walk to. It's not something mm. that you, you travel around the world to see. It's not like, you know, you go to, I don't know, Disney, <laughs> something like that. Right. You travel all around the globe or or to several cities. It's something that has to be local. So you're the the way that this is super different from other things that are going on is it has a a massively local component, right? So if you if you took your your exact store and you put it outside of LA and you try to put it let's say back in Taiwan, right? Which is where you were living a few years back, how different would that store have to look or or what what would have to be like significantly different? And again, this is assuming of course you you tinkered probably and, and and improved some things now now that you have the store and so on mm. but if you were to set it up like from scratch in taiwan what would be like seriously different right i guess i mean the main focus the main difference would be marketing and or bringing an experience for learning english <laughs> that would be a big one when i was in taiwan marketing was really a challenge for me because i didn't know the culture well enough and then also we tried to get by with translations or having someone help us a little bit, not hiring on a full on, like this Mm. is our marketing translator for our marketing material. If I did it, open the game store in Taiwan, I would definitely be hiring someone to be that point person. (laughs) Cause yeah, it was, that was our biggest challenge is kind of promoting that to local Taiwanese. I mean, there are people in Taiwan that are very familiar with Western culture and then the English marketing might connect with them, but not Mm. our Taiwanese or Chinese Mandarin marketing materials. Because it's it's one thing to go online, right? And even if you have sort of a, a little bit of a broader area and to find people who are like that, then to, you know, you're literally in a neighborhood. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, it's we, the people of that neighborhood, right? 
we would set up outside Dongmen, if anybody knows Taiwan, that station, and we would hand out flyers to people because we had our office inside our apartment. That's where we hosted classes and stuff and my tutoring. And so, yeah, I mean, I would be out there handing people and I couldn't talk to them. All I could <laughs> hand them is that flyer. And then maybe if they speak English, I can I can communicate a little bit better. But yeah, it, it, it's interesting how that would be. Like there's definitely, and then you would probably be adapting what are the games that you carry and so on. But those are the, the sort of big highlights because there is a language barrier. But then if you also go to, I don't know, Boston, which is a very different city from LA, mm. it's probably going to be, there's probably going to be differences as well. Oh yeah. And even just thinking about Los Angeles and the, I, we're in the San Fernando Valley, which is a Oh man, I can't remember how many people live here. About a million people, I believe. <laughs> and like even just different pockets of this like valley, the marketing is going to be drastically different. Like as I mentioned, we are hosting like Dungeons and Dragons camps and we did a camp with board games and developing soft skills. Stuff like that works really well where where we are at because there's a lot of families and parents with kids in the area. But if we were closer to I don't know, there's Ventura Highway. We, we could probably still kind of pull that stuff off, but there's not as much of a market to capture in that sense. It's very interesting. That That's that's so different from from the usual things that at least in my career, I've been used to it. Like I, I've worked at an international business school where people move all around the world to study, you know, mm. there. Uh, now I work at Ironhack and it's it's kind of the same thing in many ways. Like you have, you have the, well, no, actually it, it is kind of different in that way because you do have sort of global things, but then when you localize it to each market, because we're, you know, we're, we're in Madrid and Barcelona, which you kind of could say are kind of similar, but not really. Okay. But then you have yeah. Lisbon and then you have France and then mm -hmm. you have Berlin and then you have Miami and then you have Mexico <laughs> City, right? right? So there's all sorts of things to be localized, even though you're teaching literally the same technologies because it's, it's the same boot camps you might be delivering them in the local language in some cases, for example, even though the materials are all in English, you might be delivering it locally. And then, for example, I know in France, sort of the certifications are a big thing, right? So with the, there are some slight changes to make so that, you know, you can adapt to those certifications and, and how that works. So that, that could kind of be the, my, my closest experience to that because the other ones are, are too far back <laughs> for, for right, me to remember right, right. at this point. But yeah. No, it's it's interesting how that works so different, and and again it, we sort of come back to something that we we discuss every so often, right? It, and it's about knowing your players, like who are your players, what are they motivated by, where are they, where will you find them? Because if if you target a player who is in Taiwan and your store is in LA, well, you know you're not targeting the right players. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean even even the programming we create is geared towards different types of players. Like even just looking at Dungeons and Dragons, we have our Thursday D and D night, which is very casual community focused to come play. Mm. You kind of just find a group, you find your DM, the group sizes are anywhere between like five to seven people. And then we have our learn to create your first D and D character classes. And that's for someone who's never played D and D before. They want to create a character. Okay. We have learned to DM for beginners. So someone who is the DM of their group and they want to get a group together to, to start playing. And then we also have D and D for kids. So like, yeah, there's a whole wide array of players, even within games, like this particular game. And from, from that that you're saying, and, and we are sort of in the topic of understanding your players and, and understanding what it is that they do. I'm guessing that you've had some pivots, right? You, you were assuming some things that didn't pan out. Did, do you have any memory of, of any of those pivots or things that you assumed were going to be one way and it had to turn out to be another one and you had to change? Oh man, we're still pivoting. <laughs> we're still <laughs> we're still such a fresh store that we're still trying to figure out our community and figure out what, I mean, just even the days of the week that work for everyone and what days of the week work best for different games. Like our toughest community to grow so far. And I think... Hopefully, if anybody's familiar with Magic the Gathering, they have a new set coming out this Friday. I don't know when this episode comes out, but it's Dominaria Remastered. And I'm hoping this brings some Magic players out of the woodwork to come to our store. But that's been the biggest challenge. <laughs> we're, we've been trying stuff out for Magic to try to get our community growing. And one challenge with that is there are already those stores in the area. But yeah. we've never, like, that was never our real entire focus. But we definitely know there's still some, some market, there's a market to capture with Magic the Gathering because it's a pretty big card game and community too. It's it's amazing to see how it's still going and going strong. I literally remember doing that in high school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's been a while. It's, I think it came out in 92. 
And it's, it's yeah. definitely the, well, that and Pokemon, I don't know, I would have to look, but they're definitely the top two, and I, I feel like Magic might be above it. I don't but, really but know. But Pokemon came out like the series and the Game Boy game, mm. but the card game, did it came, come out around the same dates? I, I want to say no it was idea. like a year too later i'm not 100 percent certain yet but it definitely the game boy came over first and i recently watched this marketing promo for the card game back when they hmm. like the old school video it was pretty clever pretty unique if you have a chance and you're listening look up pokemon tcg first marketing video or something like that it's pretty cool <laughs> that's cool that's cool i i, I have good memories of, of pokemon and of magic the gathering and and to be fair now you're saying it started in 92 i realize that it had actually been going strong already for some time when I started looking into it. So that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say. Yeah. I, I graduated from high school in 2003. So you, you, you can gather. Oh, geez. <laughs> it's yeah. been a while. Yeah. And it's, it's growing even more now because they have the app and they've done a lot of like promotion on, I don't know, YouTube videos and stuff. And I think it's really been helping the community. I mean, I know every, most people are familiar with the rapper Post Malone. He's a big magic player and he, they brought him on to play a game on the show or like the i guess it's an app called whatnot and you can purchase like cards and stuff it's a street live streaming shopping service and they brought okay. him on to play against a fan and if the fan beat him he would give them a hundred thousand dollars so that like Ooh. huge promotion for magic and the streaming service and whatnot i mean whatnot they do a lot of crazy stuff like that interesting interesting so that that's yeah, and you can see engagers like the spirit of, of Dustin is is very very much into you know the whole iterating and seeing what things are working and what they're not, and and you can see like from small pivots where he's changed big part of his career path at this point like from from tutoring and doing some board gaming with education and, and English language learning and all these things to now actually owning a tabletop store right uh, yeah brick and mortar right and and still learning and, and still changing and pivoting and seeing what works and what doesn't. Right. Yeah. I mean, when I moved to Taiwan, we always wanted to open, like my first plan was to open a school. Okay. So then essentially, eventually I wanted to open up what we're doing here, but then I realized it was a lot smarter. I'm glad this happened. We started e-commerce first. We started doing <laughs> pop-ups, then we rented a kiosk and then we were like, okay, we can do it. And we opened the store. <laughs> from from building a school to building a tabletop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> store <laughs> with with kind of some some shared objectives there there's some education involved as well mm. and, and there's plenty of things of you know building a community that also help people learn plenty of things as well so, yeah so you, yeah you're not so far from home in that sense right? <laughs> yeah I, I i guess i i just really admire creative or outside of the box ways of learning too and that's i mean that's probably why a big appeal of game-based learning gamification was so so big to me, maybe also because a, a quote-unquote gamer background. I mean, I feel like everyone has a gamer background though. <laughs> <laughs> At this point? Yeah. <laughs> cool. And, and, and you've mentioned your wife, Grace, a few times. And, and I, I think I remember you saying that you're actually like partners on this venture. So you're both all in to, to the, with the store? Oh, yeah. She's a big help. She does work full time now. And that's part of the reason we hired on some staff because I was taking her away <laughs> from her own time, too. And it was just a bit much, I think, for both of us. And so having the extra staff is nice because now she helps like it's not she has to be here. It's more like she helps where she can because <laughs> before she would watch the register while I would host those classes. And that was pretty much any time that she was not at work. I was scheduling stuff like that. So it's good <laughs> to have the extra support of the staff. But she definitely helps a lot in other ways still. And I'm always curious about this. Was she always into games and, and liking board games and I don't know, video games as well. But was she into this kind of culture or, or is it a grown thing? Yeah, I would say a little bit. She was, I would say, more of like a family gamer growing up. She played Catan. So I feel like that's kind of rare is for people who are family gamers to play Catan. Usually it's like mm. Monopoly, Risk or stuff yeah. like that, right? Scrabble Uno. maybe. <laughs> um, Uno, yeah. So she played Catan, but that was probably the extent of how far she went in the tabletop gaming hobby. If you have like Monopoly at the bottom and then Catan a step up and then so on. But then when she, when we started kind of, I guess when we were, dating back in the US when I got into tabletop games, she kind of got into it too. And then we both really grew in the hobby together, I would say. 
Cool. That's very cool. Because I'm sure that many, many do struggle with, you know, it's my hobby, my spouse or whomever, <laughs> my boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, does not really share that. And, and it does shed some, <laughs> some hope. <laughs> right. To, yeah. To me. I mean, she's definitely not a video gamer, so she does ceramics. Yeah. So that's her kind of like her hobby. And then my mm. hobby is maybe video games. That would be the two hobbies that we don't overlap. But other than that, we kind of, and I, I do a little ceramics. I kind of help her with stuff, but very little compared to how she, <laughs> much she helps me, I think. <laughs> that sounds amazing. So Dustin, I don't know if there's anything, anything else you'd like to share of your, of your sort of new career path. If I would love to say that we have a bunch of, of listeners exactly in the neighborhood you're at <laughs> in no, LA yeah. that will visit your store, but I'm not, I, I wouldn't commit to that. I wouldn't sign my, my, <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my loan or my house on that. But is there anything you'd like to share? I don't know, anything of your experience, anything, I don't know if there's any anything digital that you guys are doing that, that people could share on, I don't know, or, or any words that you'd like to share on, on what your journey has been up to now. For sure, yeah. I think, well, you mentioned digital. We did launch a podcast, videocast too, called BG's Tabletop Talk. It's really hard for me to say, and I'm kind of regretting that name, but um, <laughs> you can check it out. It's on podcast platform, YouTube. And if anybody's in the store, just be like, hey, I heard you on the Professor Game podcast and I'll give, you a, I'll give you a slight <laughs> discount. <laughs> that would be absolutely amazing. If you do get that person, please just let me know. I don't want to stalk them or anything. I would really be excited to know that For there's sure. there, there's a listener in your area as well. That would be super cool. I mean, LA's big. It's, yeah. I mean, they could be in LA and it's a two hour drive to our store. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That, that's why I say like in your area. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when anything, because it's, you can say, oh yeah, I'm also in California. It's like, oh uh, yeah, well, California is pretty big. Well, I'm also in LA. Yeah. Two hour drive perhaps. Still, yeah. where you are. <laughs> so if they are, you know, in your area and they get to visit your store, that would be like super exciting. <laughs> At least for yeah, me. That'd be cool. <laughs> so just please do let me know. So Dustin, once again, you know, thank you very much for showing up, for being here with us. Hopefully we'll continue to collaborate together in the future. Do something, you know, depending on what your curiosity and your and your and your market <laughs> is taking you. Mm. I mean, <laughs> but at least at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey engagers, thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast. And I hope you enjoyed this interview with our repeat guest, Dustin. Do you have any questions that you would like to ask? future guests, repeat guests, new guests, whatever you want to go for. If that is the case, go to professorgame.com slash question and ask your question. If it is selected, it'll come up in a future episode and you'll get your answer live on the show. And remember, before going on to your next mission, what do I always say? Remember to subscribe or follow for free on your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.